Hello and welcome to the third episode of Death and Taxes, a weekly podcast by the private client team at Burgess Salmon. Uh, my name is Tim Williams and I'm a tax and trust lawyer in the private client team. And together with my tax and trust colleagues Guy Broadfield and Edward Hayes, we'll discuss a range of issues facing clients and professionals alike. Each episode will be joined by specialist lawyers from around the firm to bring you our views on important topics for private clients. In today's podcast, we will discuss the proposed reforms to capital gains tax put forward by the Office of Tax Simplification. And Guy and I will be joined by Helen McLeod, who sits with us in the private client team with a specialism in UK tax and trusts advice to UK and international clients. So I think it would be fair to say that as we stand now, we're in a very different fiscal landscape to this time a year ago. And you constantly see in the papers talk about government borrowing and just how we might come to pay for COVID and, and all of that sort of good stuff. Um, and one thing that captures the public's imagination is changes to the tax system to, to pay for that. And over the course of the last few months, you've seen it in the papers, you've heard on the radio, um, you've had the Wealth Tax Commission report come out in December suggesting a wealth tax. You've had speculation about possible changes or increases to income tax or, or VAT and national insurance. But they, they, those are discussions for another time. And, and today's pod, of course, focuses on capital gains tax. Um, and it was back in uh, November, or October, November last year, that the Office of Tax Simplification published their reports into how you might change the capital gains tax uh, regime. Um, so, I mean, Tim, in, in broad terms for our, for our listeners, perhaps you could just explain what the OTS is and why they were looking or indeed are looking at capital gains tax and uh, and who, who told them to put forward some ideas. Well, so in terms of um, what the OTS is, um, the, it's the Office of Tax Simplification. And as the name suggests, their remit is to examine the tax system and suggest ways in which it might work better. Um, and obviously, in the world of tax, that means quite a lot of different things. Um, and at various points over the last couple of years, the Chancellor um, has asked the um, ATS to look at different taxes. So it was asked to look at inheritance tax, which resulted in um, two reports over the last couple of years. And then in July this year, the Chancellor asked the ATS to look at capital gains tax. Um, and he asked them to identify opportunities relating to administrative and technical issues, as well as areas where the present rules can distort behaviour or do not meet their policy intent. So it's quite a broad brief the ATS have been given there. Um, but this is sort of reasonably typical of what the ATS is asked to do. So the ATS has now produced the first of two reports. Um, and the first one is looking at uh, policy design and principles underpinning capital gains tax. Um, and we're expecting the second one in 2021, which will look at some tech and administrative points. Um, but so this, this, this report is, is um, rather more high level and covers quite a lot of ground. Um, but we thought today it's probably worth drawing out uh, only a few of those points um, and I think that the, the, the main points that um, that we've thought bear um, some additional scrutiny are the proposals around aligning the tax rates with income tax so it's quite a big point because um, the rates are quite far apart at the moment um, the removal of what's known as the CGT uplift on death um, and then also there's some changes afoot to um, to business asset disposal relief, which most people know as entrepreneurs relief. Um, so, I mean, looking first at the um, at the rates point, I mean, Helen, do you want to um, talk us through what the ATS is talking about there? Sure. So this is the thing that really caught most of the headlines, um, and that's the proposal to align rates for CGT and income tax. So currently income tax is charged at between 20 and 45 percent, whereas CGT is charged at 10 or 20 percent or 18 or 28 percent in uh, for gains on residential property and um, so the gap is currently quite wide and the concern of the ATS is that this differentiation in rates leads to a distortion of taxpayer behaviour so in other words it encourages taxpayers to arrange their, their affairs um, so that income can be realised as um, or recharacterised as capital gains and um, so so the, the report sort of highlighted that while this could raise potentially significant sums for the revenue, before implementing any changes, it would be necessary for the government to consider a few main issues. So um, what the primary one is really what we do about inflationary gains. So generally it's accepted that tax shouldn't be charged on any part of the gain which has arisen solely because of inflation. 
Um, and by that, I mean, so if you put if you purchase an asset for a hundred pounds and sell it for ten years later, it might have increased to say one hundred and fifty pounds simply because of the inflation that's occurred during that period. It's not really a true gain in the sense that it doesn't um, create any monetary benefit for the owner. Um, and in the past, it has been suggested that these inflationary gains are addressed by a combination of uh, the low rates of CGT, which we have as against income tax, um, and also the currently fairly generous annual exempt amount um, that stands at 12,300 12, um, at the moment. It should sort of be noted that actually as part of this report, the OTS have also suggested lowering that significantly. Um, but currently it's it's 12,300 um, and it increases each year in line with inflation. So that's, it's sort of been argued in the past that that takes into account the, the inflationary effect. However, it's sort of a fairly arbitrary approach because it doesn't actually consider the amount of gains um, which have arisen or how long the asset has been held for. So, Instead, we could consider having um, like a form of, in, of indexation on capital gains. Prior to 1998, there was an indexation allowance um, on capital gains for this very purpose of, of addressing the inflationary gains issue, but it was scrapped by Gordon Brown because it was too complicated. And of course, while that might happen again, the OTS have suggested that modern technology could, could assist with it nowadays. So it might be a more practical approach in the modern era. But it's still, it's still a problem for them to try and consider as this as part of the more practical, you know, you can talk about principle, but it's all in, the devil is in the detail, as we all know, as tax tax lawyers. Um, I mean, I guess in terms of distortion of behaviour, taxpayers will arrange their affairs in the way that they think is, is most tax efficient in, in most cases. So, I mean, does it mean that if you've got alignment of income and CGT rates that people might be more willing or look at exploring putting assets into companies and therefore their assets being subject to corporate tax rates instead of income tax or CGT. Absolutely and corporation tax rates are significantly lower than 19% than income tax rates. Currently obviously that's quite similar to CGT rates um, so it, it doesn't really affect thinking necessarily from that perspective but if CGT rates were to increase dramatically there would be far more of an incentive to try and arrange things to make use of corporation tax, for example, by putting things into family investment companies, um, yeah. which are a type of, of company that that sort of the wealthier families can hold their affairs through. Obviously, that option would only be open to those with greater resources. So you would have to consider the equity of having that as an option. Yeah, and it's fair to say there have always been, and there are some taxpayers who operate in industries, thinking of private equity industry, where you know, a lot of their structuring is based on trying to make sure that they achieve a capital gain rather than income by way of the sort of their remuneration. So I assume that that's an example of an industry that would look closely at the rules and possibly look to make use of corporate vehicles going forward if that was the lower tax environment f for them, just as they do at the moment in terms of trying to make sure that what they get is classified as capital rather than income in their um, private equity structures. Sure and the ATS uh, did address this boundary issue as they call it between the income tax and CGT rates um, and you know, as mentioned because of this disparity in rates there is this incentive to recharacterize income as gains um, and as you say Guy it is, it is common and very legitimate tax planning in many industries and um, so an example given in the ATS report as well is um, owner managed companies where they, the owner managers are taxed at low rates if they retain the profits arising from their personal labour um, and realise these profits on a sale or liquidation of the business, um, which is charged at corporation tax rates as opposed to withdrawing them at dividends, as dividends, which um, is taxed at income tax rates. Um, so it can sort of distort behaviour in this way and lead um, them to arranging it so that they only take a salary in the form of income up to a basic rate of tax. Um, and the OTS's view that this these these boundary issues puts pressure on the on the income tax and CGT rates um, and provides sort of greater opportunities for the wealthy to make use of options available to them. But I think it's important to note that part of the reason for these is to encourage entrepreneurial activity um, and risk taking, which is necessary to build a sort of healthy economy. And um, so a balance does need to be be struck with these issues.
And then, I mean, Tim, to come on to this, the second point you've talked about in terms of what the OTS proposals, possibly the one of even greater application to, to taxpayers across the board is the idea that the, the so-called CGT uplift on death is is removed. Um, Tim, do you want to just explain what the CGT uplift is on death and then Helen talk about what the ATS thinks about it? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, at the moment, um, essentially, uh, the assets held on death are um, rebased in value terms um, at the date of death. So basically capital gains tax works by taxing the difference in value when you acquire an asset to the value when you dispose of it. And dispose could be by way of sale or gift or various other things. So if um, an asset value is uplifted um, at, the, at the date of death, you get a current valuation. So if you later dispose of it, you pay less capital gains tax. And that's the, 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 the general gist of it. The issue um, that's been um, identified is whether that leads people to hold on to assets uh, for a longer time uh, to then take advantage of that CGT uplift and sell assets shortly after death with no capital gains tax. Um, so there's a risk of behaviour being distorted uh, in in that sense. Um, I mean, Helen, do you do what, what did the report um, draw any more conclusions from it? It did. <laughs> it, um, it in fact split it into three main recommendations about uh, the CGT uplift. So the uh, the first one was that often on death you get this CGT uplift. So you it, so you take the assets at um, the market value as at the date of death, as Tim said, but you can also get an, in, an exemption from inheritance tax, for example, if assets pass to a spouse or are within your no way ban, so you end up paying no tax at all. Ultimately, the purpose of the, the uplift, I think, is to to avoid you paying both CGT and inheritance tax. So the the report sort of highlights that a lot of people end up paying neither CGT or inheritance tax because because of this um because of the exemptions aligned with the uplift. Um, so the first recommendation is that where a relief or exemption from inheritance tax applies, the government should consider removing the capital gains tax uplift on death. Um, and instead provide that the recipient of the asset is treated as acquiring it at the base cost of the person who died. So, for example, then, Helen, if, if um, uh, husband and wife, uh, which, if we're talking about husband and wife here, husband buys an asset in 1990 for £1,000, uh, he dies in 2020 when it's worth 100000 um, because there'll be no inheritance tax to pay if he leaves it to his wife. Uh, rather than um, the wife having an uplifted base cost of 100,000, she has the thousand pound base cost from 1990. Is that is that the general idea? So if she sold it, she'd have a much bigger gain to pay tax on. Yeah, absolutely. So that would ensure that either CGT or inheritance tax is paid, um, rather than rather than neither. So that was the first main recommendation, which would have quite a wide-reaching effect on many people. Um, but then the the ATS report did take it further. So the second recommendation was that in addition, the government should consider removing the uplift on death more widely, um, regardless of the inheritance tax treatment. So every recipient of an asset on death would take it at the base cost of the deceased rather than the market value as at the date of death. Um, the issue with this is that the administrative burden could be really quite high in that every asset would need to be you have to get the base cost of every asset um, and pass it along to the relevant recipient. Um, and if they sell it 10, 15 years after the death, it could be quite tricky. Um, so the OTS suggested that for part of this, the executors of the estate, so the people who administer the estate on someone's death, um, would have to calculate the notional gains that sit within that asset as at the date of death alongside the inheritance tax calculations, um, which would mean that the person who then later goes on to sell the asset that only have to calculate the uh, part of the game which had arisen during their ownership. Um, so that was the second point. And then the, the third and final recommendation with regard to the uplift was that um, if the government does remove the uplift more widely, it should consider rebasing all assets um, to a particular point. So you don't have this issue where you have to know the exact date on which every single asset was, was acquired by the deceased. They said perhaps a, a good year for this would be the year 2000 on the basis that uh, the land registry had started registering quite a lot of properties in the 90s and it might be easier to assess values um, as at the year 2000. Um, query really whether this would solve many of the administrative issues on the basis that yes property you can probably 
find the value of in year 2000 relatively re- um, easily, all other assets, you'd probably have significantly more difficulties, particularly as time goes on. So in 2030 and 2040, the value in the year 2000 becomes more and more hard to, to ascertain. And so you might need to keep changing the, re- the rebasing year, which would just add to the complexity. It's just considerable, again, practical difficulties to mm-hmm. to this that, I mean, particularly to your second point, Helen, the idea that executors would then have to take on this sort of quasi accountancy function in the interest of establishing what the what a gain was at, any, at the, the time of death to pass that information on. I mean, all well and good if you are uh, advising uh, individuals acting as executors on that, but it's a lot. It's a lot of it's a big burden. A lot, a lot of compli- additional compliance at a time which is already quite administratively difficult. The cost as well in, in terms yeah. of administering the estate. They're not. It's not a small exercise to do this. And it's worth noting as well, isn't it, that the current um, there's a, a current rebasing to 1982 values, uh, which causes enough headaches now that we're um, you know nearly 40 years down the line from 1982. So um, you know, it, it, taking an arbitrary date doesn't actually make things any easier, although it nationally it nationally reduces the amount of gains, which is yeah. which is the idea. I mean, perhaps better than leaving it at 82 and saying mm, quite and removing the uplift, but still not. Not great. Well, uh, not without some difficulties. Then the the CGT uplift. I mean, it's worth as a quick aside. There are, there are also some proposals to abolish one form of relief aimed at uh, investors and entrepreneurs, and indeed uh, significantly alter another. Helen, do you want to just quickly t- touch on those? Yeah. So I'll start with the one which is the um, one being abolished or proposed to be abolished is the investors' relief. Um, it is an a sort of a sister to entrepreneurs relief in a way um but the difference is that it rather than being aimed at entrepreneurs who are involved in a business it is um specifically involved at investors who are not connected to um businesses which need to be unlisted trading companies and uh, the purpose of it was to really encourage investment um and enable enlisted companies to access capital it was only brought in in 2016 uh, and to make use of it, you had to have held the asset or held the investments for three years from 2016. So you could only claim this relief from the 6th of April 2019. Um, when you did claim it, it would reduce the CGT to 10% up to a lifetime cap of 10 million. Problem is no one's used it and no one's really interested in using it. And um, the OTS report basically said that they had no interest at all. And so the government should really consider abolishing it. It seems slightly premature to do, abolish something when it's only been available for about 18 months. That said, if you're going to abolish a relief, abolish the one that nobody uses because nobody will complain. Quite. <laughs> Would be the argument. Um, anyway, <laughs> and and and, also, and so it's perhaps more uh, importantly, uh, proposals to changes to business asset disposal relief, formerly entrepreneurs relief to all of us who knew it under that name. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this one, which actually is genuinely quite quite popular and the, the take up's quite high on it. Um, the OTS think that it is mistargeted um, if its aim is to see, stimulate business investment and risk taking. And in their view, it's sort of been understood that its, it's other objective should be uh, to provide a specific relief when business owners retire. So um, on that basis, their, their view is if this is the objective, the government should um, consider Sort of reworking it to make it more aligned with it, with this plan. So, they the suggestions they give are to um, increase the minimum shareholding, perhaps twenty five percent. So currently it is five percent, which someone needs to hold in a company, uh, in order to uh, to qualify for this relief. Um, so they suggest increasing that to twenty five percent, so that it's aimed more at owner managers of businesses rather than uh, to the sort of broader class of employees. They've also suggested increasing the holding period, um, perhaps to 10 years. And again, this is this is aimed at making it available to people who've built business up over time rather than just being involved for a shorter period. Um, and the, the, the final thing they suggest is possibly introducing an age limit um, as to when you can actually claim it, which is would be based on um, the age limits and pension freedoms, um, which would make it align with this idea that it's, it's more of a sort of retirement relief rather than a, a more general um a generally available relief um so quite stark changes there in terms of 
of how it functions and who who can make use of it. So it's, it's worth noting, Alan, isn't it, that actually entrepreneurs' relief, as as we know, it has been scaled back quite significantly over the last few years, um, and the scope of it's been narrowed a bit. So the, the thresholds have come down. Um, it used to be 10 million of, of gains, a lifetime allowance of 10 million of gains, and now it's down to 1 million, and the ownership periods, et cetera, have been, have, have been extended. So it might be that this, um, this, this round of proposals is the sort of nail in the coffin of entrepreneurs' relief as we know it, and a move back to something that looks a little bit more like retirement relief as we used to know it. Um, but yeah, a significant change in any case. So, I mean, there, there are many significant practical consequences of if these proposals are indeed implemented by the government that will affect practitioners and, and, and clients alike. And it's probably worth at this point taking a step back and, and thinking about how likely it is that these changes would be brought in. I mean, Clearly, in normal times, the government asks the OTS to review the tax system and suggest changes, and that is all well and good. Uh, and as part of an efficient sort of tax system, it's good to review and hopefully improve and change. But uh, I think you know we have to look at this review and report in the context of the current public finances. And, and let's be honest, you know the, the OTS has been asked by Rishi Sunak to look at this particular tax in the context of COVID and there must have been some nod you'd imagine from central government to say feel free to be quite far reaching in your proposals because you know nothing's off the table in terms of tax changes or how we go about paying for all of this. So it's probably in, in that context that we have to look at, at the proposals. Now I mean do we think that there probably is value in saying well, these would be quite wide, wide ranging and fundamental changes to the tax system. And maybe the government, the chance has put something out there only to then in practice, only change the system a little bit. I don't know, Jay, do you think that's likely? So as in, it, he's, he's proposed something that sounds really quite bad. And actually when he doesn't do something that's as bad as he's definitely thought it might be, everyone's happy. Uh, or, or maybe not happy, but maybe less angry than they otherwise might be. Because uh, I mean, I think one of the things that Helen has certainly has very helpfully raised is that uh, changing those broad principles comes with a significant amount of complexity. You know, how, how about aligning rates with income tax, etc. Uh, and so, if you then practically think, well, that's very difficult, and also it's not really a vote winner, it might not get much traction with the government, or at least with uh, Rishi, Rishi Sunak uh, on, a, on a political level. So, but that doesn't mean that he will do nothing. Uh, so do we think at least, for example, rate rises might be possible in the short term? And by short term, I think, you know, from 6th April next year, uh, 2021. Yeah, maybe rather than the um, alignment with income tax, which is the sort of worst case scenario that everyone's been working to, it might be that there's a rate increase that doesn't go quite as far as up to the full, um, full income tax rate, um, uh, coupled with other other recommendations from the ATS um, that don't go quite as far but um, as, the, as the ATS suggests but still increase rates and erode some of the reliefs. One possibility is that they just go back to the rates of 2016 so previously the rates were, 20, were 18 and 28 percent rather than 10 and 20 and only 18 28 for residential property and when they were actually reduced it was it was a bit of a shock no one was really expecting it and didn't really ask for it so um it might just be that they simply go back up to those slightly higher rates that everyone was quite used to, at least in the first instance. Um, in terms of timings, they could raise rates slightly in 2021. I think any significant change is more likely to happen in, from 6 April 2022, um, just given, as we say, these are quite complex changes and quite wide reaching and that the draftsman would need time to, to uh, you know, prepare them properly and then pass, get them passed through government. So I, I don't think it's an immediate change that we need to be terrified of. Yeah, well, I mean, it's all at the end of the day, it's all, all guesswork and subject to political change and, and circumstances, of course, who, who knows what might happen um, uh, in, the, in the coming months. But I, mean, I guess from a practical perspective, to the extent you have transactions that are going on at the moment, it makes sense to accelerate them and make sure they complete uh, before the end of the current tax year. So before uh, 6th April 2021. Um, 
and to the extent individuals are thinking about making gifts uh then that that's it's also a good reason to do it in this tax year when you know at least what the capital gains tax position will be for, for, on those on those transfers um so that's that's where we are for the moment with capital gains tax um no doubt there is scope for us to discuss further tax change and reform on future podcasts, not least uh, the uh, novel idea of a, of a wealth tax. But that is a particularly difficult beast and one that lends itself to perhaps even a special episode. Thanks again for listening to Death and Taxes, a weekly podcast by the Burgess Salmon private client team. You can find out more about Burgess Salmon and our team at burgess-salmon.com or on our LinkedIn page. Our next episode will cover exit planning for family businesses, so don't forget to subscribe and thanks again for listening.